Hello and welcome to Daily Stone Creations. My name is Johnny, and this video is about the Executioner Three String Beta. Now, you've never seen that before, and you've probably never really seen anything like it apart from maybe C Six Steve's Diddly Bow. Except this is kind of a metal version of that. Now, I didn't actually really document the build of the guitar itself. I did, however, document the build of the case because it's a coffin. And it's not just like a guitar case that's, oh, it's in the vague shape of a coffin. No, it's a coffin. <laughs> I'm going to press play and narrate over the top of it and see what the hell happens. Here we go. Fun fact number one. I don't normally plan my projects, so this was quite a rare occasion. First thing to do was to cut the base and the lid. I had to tape two rulers together to actually get the full distance. And to get the main template, I just drew around the instrument, which you will notice does change a bit. You'll see that in the next video. My trusty eBay find bandsaw. Doesn't ever cut straight. Always cuts at an angle, and wonky, but for this kind of thing, works perfect. See? The wood that I chose for this is... well, it's about a hundred years old. It's from my great granddad's fireplace, in fact. Funny thing is, most of it was actually pretty dry rotten and not quite diseased, but not in the best condition. But with a bit of work, it came out nice. So it did, in fact, the plywood base and lid. I kind of thought by adding this wood dye, it'd slightly match. Maybe it'd be a similar colour. <laughs> what it actually turned out to be was very nearly perfect. I couldn't quite believe how well this plywood came out, especially considering that this was scrap plywood, which I got off a plumber friend who'd taken it off a boiler cabinet. But there you go. This stuff is called bead and reel. Now, at the time, I didn't know what it was called, and the only thing I did know is it, along with these pieces I'm holding now, were incredibly fragile. So, I couldn't really get away with normal construction techniques of adding loads and loads of screws and gluing it all together because I kind of thought it would sort of just rip itself apart, to be honest. These angles were quite difficult to work out initially, but as soon as you get your head round it that, well, they're 45 degree angles between the two pieces, so you half it. So, set the bobbin sander to 22 and a half degrees, and there you go. And it is worth pointing out, this is long before I actually had a router. It would have been much easier to uh, set something up, oh, or a circular saw in fact. It would have been much easier to set something up with that. And again, this is um, something to not rely on the strength of the actual wood itself and add some strengthening into it. So these were very, very strong but lightweight pine angle pieces which were cut individually and sanded. and then added to each individual piece of the side panels. Not to the base, or at least not yet. This was quite an interesting bit. Trying to add the pieces to the base, I had to clamp them in place first, and then drill from underneath, because they weren't secure enough to 
hold the thing upside down, so it had to be trailed from underneath. Once I'd done that, I could then add screws from the base as well. Oh yeah, and then my clamp broke as well. <laughs> so there we go. That's the pieces screwed from the bottom. And actually, the screws look pretty cool. I did later remove each screw and uh, countersink them and make them more level. To secure the top pieces, sorry, the side pieces even, I hatched a plan for some aluminium pieces. Some to go inside and some to go outside. Now, it is worth pointing out it's not really a good idea to cut aluminium with an angle grinder, but I seem to remember that this was the first project I'd ever done that with, so this is where I found out not to do it. You're best off with some tin snips. But the bonus was they did come out flat and level. Unfortunately, there was a lot of cleaning up to do on the sides and the edges. <laughs> I've narrated this three times and I've forgotten to pull that funny face every time now. The next plan, clamp them together and shape them because half of them are going on the outside and I didn't just want them to be bricks. And these took even longer to clean up than the square ones did, for obvious reasons. Each one had four holes drilled in and a slight angle bent in each one. After that each one was countersunk And then the ones that needed a sharper angle, bent by hand, and then screwed into place. With a very professional and reliable way of screwing things in. <laughs> it is worth pointing out, actually, between takes I did remove these pieces and then add glue in between the pieces of wood. After that, there were then pins put in place, angled between each piece, just to make sure it was extra secure. And then the base and lid that weren't quite lined up with the side panels were screwed in place, taken to the bobbin sander, and then evened up. Of course part of this was I cut the base perfectly straight but of course a hundred years of being shaped for a fireplace and then another 30 or 40 years in my granddad's garage it meant that the pieces of wood weren't quite straight and the same can be said about the width of them as well. I then had to sand all of the side panels because some of the wood didn't actually have any finish on. So I kind of wanted it all to match-ish. Not, not fully, but, you know, just enough to make it look like an old coffin rather than an old coffin made out of a fireplace. And with both the top and the base panel sorted, and evenly matched to all the side panels. It could be unscrewed. And then in the lids case, it was time to fit some edging strips. Because of course, I hadn't actually considered. In order to attach a hinge, it needs to have an edge. So these were glued and screwed into place, countersunk, all in the same way as the rest of it. Except in this case, it was a little bit more fiddly. Much easier to manage in the long run, because of course the pieces are 10mm tall and not 200, <laughs> like the side panels. So in the case of these ones, I could actually clamp them together. And then to make it so I didn't have to leave 
several clamps on the entire pieces of wood for several hours, you just screw them in place after gluing, and then remove the clamp. And then noticing that the edge pieces of pine didn't match the rest of it, I added the same wood, uh, what's it called, stain, <laughs> to the rest of it. And then, for a change of scenery, back to my room, which, it must be said, this is about three years ago, maybe even four. It's changed a lot since then. So the reason I brought it home was because I didn't dare use any tools on the bead and reel in my workshop, because I knew I would break it. Even cleaning it had to be used with a super delicate, super fine paintbrush. If I'd used a cloth on this, it would have just snapped in half. Which, actually, if you pay attention to how straight it is now, and then how much it flexes when I'm just trying to move it to put it in place to glue it, yeah, that's... Uh, it, it was literally bending under the weight of the glue. That's how weak it was. And it must be said, we're in 2018 now, and I built this in 2015, and it's still on there. It hasn't broken. So it's either stronger than I thought it was, or putting this tape on it and making it properly secure really, really did work. Hope you don't mind the budgies singing in the background, by the way. They're actually being lovely and quiet and just chirping away for once, rather than scraging in my ear. And the final piece of all this, mechanically wise, was this piano hinge, which for four pounds of piano hinge, it turns out you get very cheap and rubbish screws. If you buy one of those, I advise replacing the screws. So these lecturers were then added, and then it's time to furnish the inside, starting with this red felt, which if you've seen any of my previous videos, you'll recognise that red felt from adding it to keyboard keys, just to give the keyboards a little bit of a sort of professional looking piano touch. And then it was time to add some stuffing to make it all soft in the inside. And oh my word, I wish it was that easy and happened that quickly in real life. <laughs> and then the final piece of it was adding this purpley velour. And before the big reveal, it's worth noting, these clasps are chromed, aren't they? Well, not anymore. So the completed case really looked quite impressive. It's changed a little bit since then. I've added some more metal edges to keep it stronger and keep it from getting marked. The lid's still wonky though, but I'm still incredibly impressed that there was a perfect book match on that play on plywood. Also impressed at these gate handles as well. They look perfect for a half-size coffin. Who'd have thunk it? All of the clasps, all of the aluminium parts, they were all painted black. A black stripe was added around the piece of side panel that didn't have any bead and reel in because, well, I couldn't find any more. And the executioner beta itself has also changed. Both from here and from in the leprous cover. The hardware has changed, the pickups have changed, or pick up rather, and that hardware actually went in the git base. The coil tapping is still there though. That is the Executioner Beta, and it's rather fantastic coffin case, if I do say so myself. I think I've explained everything quite well in that.
It has changed a little bit, so in the demo video that's coming out, hopefully a week after this one, I'll give you a good demo of the instrument and show you the case, and I think that'll be about it for this video. Join me again in the next one. As always, stay creative. Sweet, that worked.